which the attorney has written for us. So we have that blank in there. You'll fill it in. We'll never have this issue in the real world because that blank says to close on blank and we write a date. So we won't have that issue. Now. Am I bringing, I'm sorry. I Go have ahead. a question. I'm thinking I'm confusing the two different things. So this isn't the same as when you gave a scenario. I'm sorry, and I don't have all the verbiage together. I'm getting it together. But um, you gave us the scenario that you showed an open house. Someone wanted to purchase it, but they came the day after your contract in it. And so therefore, um, we have a broker's like broker in place. I, broker protection clause. Broker protection clause. So with so with a broker protection clause, am I confusing the two guys? Would you still be able to use your broker protection if your client that's the buyers is like three days behind and the bank something happened and so now he still wants to purchase or whatever? No, the broker protection clause protects you after the contract has legally ended. The time of, of the essence is the duration of the contract. So like if I list a house in January 1, I'm going to list it to July 1. Right. And we explain that in our contract, start date, stop date. The right, broker have protection clause protects me after the contract has expired. Whereas okay. of the essence deals with the expiration of the contract of the contract of the contract so we've got a listing contract that would be time is of the essence in this contract and then the protection clauses after the contract expires okay. we have no protection clause in a purchase agreement once okay. it expires on the may the 30th at midnight it auto it expires and there's no protection after expiration, okay. all right? So time is of the essence is the definition time frame stated for a contract. The broker protection clause is specific to real estate, which deals with protecting our agency after the contract has expired. The time is of the essence, Shauna, is a general contract concept. All contracts work under that, must have that in there, all right? Broker protection is only specific to agency law and a listing contract specifically. There is no protection in the purchase agreement. There's no protection in a deed. It's only specific term inside of our listing contract, which protects us after Time is of the essence has expired. All right. <laughs> now, here's the cool thing about a contract. As long as it fits all five parts, so let's assume that's true. You guys can do anything you agree on in a contract as long as it fits all five parts, which means you can change the terms of the contract. You want to lower your visa rate to 1%, call Visa. Hey, I want to lower my rate from 12% to 1%. If they say, okay, then you do it. But it's what? Bilateral. So Visa would have to say yes. If Visa says, are you high? We're not changing your term. We're sticking with the original contract. Then you don't change it. So we, as real estate professionals, will change a contract all of the time for our buyers and sellers. Most commonly, we change closing date. Hey, we're, remember, time is of the essence, May the 30th. We agree on it. Come May the 29th, I call you and go, hey, dude, we got a problem. My seller is in Hawaii golfing. 
and you go, yeah, guess what? He's golfing with my buyer. So my buyer's in Hawaii too. Oh, let's change the closing date from May the 30th to July the 10th. Okay, as long as both parties agree, you just change the contract. We agree on a price, 100,000. We find some stuff wrong inside of the inspection and my buyer says, you know what? I'll buy your property, but I now wanna buy it at 97,000 to fix those repairs. And the seller says, I agree to lower the price to 97 so you can fix the repairs. We just change the contract. We can change anything in the contract as long as both parties agree. And there are two ways to change the contract. The first one I want to look at is the top of the other page. It is called a novation. Novation. A novation is the parties stay the same. This is a visual joke, which is kind of hard on this, but the contract changes. The parties stay the same, but the contract changes. It goes from May the 30th to July the 10th. Still between the same buyer and seller. It goes from 100,000 to 97,000. Still the same buyer and seller. That is a novation. We change something in the contract, but the buyers and sellers remain the same people. Now, here's the visual flip on this. Now, on the previous page, which we've touched on once before, is an assignment. Now, the contract stays the same and the people change. All right, visual joke, make sure. A novation, people stay the same, contract changes. In an assignment, the contract stays the same and the people change. And if you recall, when we talked about selling the note, the IOU, and then I would assign the mortgage, that mortgage contract stays the same. It is now changing people from Raymond and Fifth Third to Raymond and PNC Bank because Fifth Third sold it to PNC and assigned the mortgage with it. So the contract stays the same. I still pay the 553 a month for 30 years at 6% interest, but now instead of paying it to fifth third, I pay to PNC. So contract stays the same, people change, that's an assignment. People stay the same and the contract changes, that's a novation. We novate the contract. Thumbs up. All right. Now, occasionally, there's going to be what they call a breach of contract. A breach of contract is where one of the parties fails to perform something that they are required to do inside of the contract. They fail to do it, like buy the property. They were offered you, you went under contract, they didn't buy the property like they were supposed to. They can actually be sued for what's called specific performance. They failed to perform, and this is how we would get paid on deals that didn't close. The seller would sue the buyer 
and said, you didn't buy the property, you failed to perform, you have breached the contract, I now have been harmed because I was going to get money. So I'm suing you for specific performance. It's called a suit for specific performance. It is a lawsuit and the judge will then render a judgment. And like I told you in the one I was involved at, the judge literally said, I can't make you buy it, but I can make you pay for it. I can make you pay for it under a specific performance. That is how much the seller was harmed was $10,000 because you didn't perform like you were supposed to. So the judge found in the favor of the plaintiff, i.e. the seller, and told the defendant, I can't make you take the title, but I can make you pay for it. All right. Now there are statute of limitations for specific performance, and I'm not a practicing attorney, so we're not gonna go into specific ones, but that performance, uh, that limitation can range anywhere from two to seven years, depending on what it is. If you were in the conception of trying to sue for specific performance, contact an attorney. He will be more clued in on that timeline for that specific issue. Now, there are some other reasons to terminate the contract other than breach. So on your page there at uh, 193, there's a whole bunch of different ones we can talk about. A couple of them like partial performance, substantial performance. Uh, one of the good examples you will see is this. In a new home sale, brand new home, the builder will agree to sod the front yard, right? We all understand what sod is. They cannot sod in January. So what they will do is they will say, I'll tell you what, let's go ahead and close the house so that you can get in and we'll come back in May and sod your property to finish our agreement. So in essence, you are closing it under substantial performance. They haven't performed 100% because they can't lay sod in January, but you're gonna go ahead and close knowing that the full performance will be committed later. So partial or substantial, virtually the same concept. <laughs> there can be the impossibility of performance. That could cause the contract to terminate. You guys, <clears throat> This example's great, but we're getting further away. You guys remember when the tornado hit the state fairgrounds and destroyed the stage at the state fairgrounds? It's now been five years ago. All of the bands that were scheduled to perform on that stage got released from their contract because there was no stage. You can't perform on a stage if there is no stage, it was destroyed. And now, whose fault? Can't really fault either property, person. So it's called impossibility of performance. What, like, global wide, like the pandemics fall under this? Like, the impossibility of performance since, like, say we're in quarantine, we can't go anywhere. Would that be like, can we do anything on my side? So would that well, kind of fall under that? That's why we came out with some of this new verbiage to try yeah. and allow this to not now, not now be, I don't know if that's proper English, not now be impossible. Um, there is a lot of stuff that has gone on, Cameron, in the last week in this industry that would be really cool that you guys, I wish you guys could see or know. One of the things title companies are now doing, this is a genius idea, I love this, in order to combat what you're saying, they are now doing what they call curbside closings. Curbside closings. 
instead of literally going into the office and sitting across from the table, what they're doing now is a car will pull up at their parking lot and they will send one person out and then the buyer sits over here in their car and then they go to that car and go back and do it this way. Much like the old, uh, what were they called? Uh, the girls on roller skates at your car hops, how they would come to your window and bring you the food. They're now actually back to doing that with clothing so that somebody can go, well, I can't perform because I don't want to be in public. Okay, we found a way to combat that now. We're doing these curbside closings. Now, you could argue, well, I still got to talk to that one person. So what I'm telling you now, mark my words, write this down. Raymond said this, and I think I've said it before. The next evolution of this is this. I'm, we're literally going to close like this. Now, I don't need to drive to Greenwood. I don't need to touch you, see you, breathe on you, or let you do that to me. I can stare in your eyes and see that you're the buyer and you, I'm the seller and we're going to sign and then I'm going to hit print on my printer and it's going to print my copy up at my house and you're going to be sitting wherever you're at, Cameron. You're going to hit print on your printer and it's all going to print on yours and thank you very much. Have a good day. And you're going to wire the money in and, and the, when they close, they're going to wire me the money to my bank. It will be here specifically now because of this pandemic issue that there are going to be people that are going to go, let's go to the next evolution of car hop into virtual closings. All right. So the impossibility deals with in the scenario that I gave up until now because of this uh, pandemic thing is the stage because there is no stage. You could argue at some point that even if you're afraid to go out, technology now has made it so that you could potentially not still perform without going out under this kind of technology we're using. We'll be uh, doing listings like this too, Raymond. Do what? Like showings, we'll be doing like showings in this type of form. There are agents right now that are doing virtual showings. Yeah, and they're I've been doing it much like this on a mobile phone where they're talking to their client and they're like walking through and then the client will go, hey, back up. I want to look at the stove again. Okay. And they show them the stove. Is there anything else you want to see? Yeah, what's the brand? Okay, well, hold on. I can get real close. So yeah, there are agents now that are... The agents are still going into the house because we are deemed, and don't get me on my soapbox on this, we are deemed, um, what, what's the term? Where we're exempt? Essential. Essential. We're deemed essential. So we have been taking precautions like the uh, Josh, for instance, wears the latex gloves everywhere he goes and then takes them off and puts them throws him in the back of his truck for that showing. So he will go in and he is taking the risk, but we are mitigating it with, you know, sanitizers and gloves and face masks and all of that. And the client is sitting at home and Josh literally is directed by the client as to what to look at. All right. So yes, there are virtual showings that are going on currently. So that's going, so this, like I said, this issue that has arisen has forced a lot of technology up to bubble up to the top that you're going to see is going to become standard practice. And this might be one of the standards of practice that we do this kind of virtual showing. The thing that may suck for virtual showings for us, think about this. How many showings could a client have if they hired every one of us 
to do a virtual showing. I could look at Sarah's phone and five minutes later be looking at Christina's and then five minutes later looking at Shauna's and then five. So in theory, I could see eight houses in half an hour because I've got you standing at one, you standing at one, you standing at one, you standing at one. That would suck for us <clears throat> because now we're competing against five or six other agents showing properties. But I mean, I can see that as being a, a, a logical way a buyer can now see dozens of properties in a matter of two hours sitting at home wearing just a shirt and underwear. Not that I'm doing that. All right. <clears throat>